Okay, our first presentation um, for the second half of session four uh, is about Mallows Bay as a maritime cultural landscape. And we have two presenters. The first is Susan Langley. Um, Dr. Langley has been the Maryland State Underwater Archaeologist for more than 20 years, directing the Maryland Maritime Archaeology Program. She is an adjunct professor at several colleges and universities where she teaches underwater archaeology and the history of piracy. I think uh, we need to talk to her at the cocktail party. Uh, she also taught maritime archaeology in Thailand for several years. Um, she's an active master scuba diver trainer and lectures globally on a variety of subjects. And then I love the last part of her bio. She's also the governor's beekeeper. So, <laughs> um, Our second presenter um, for this topic is Deborah Marks. And she is a maritime archaeologist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. She has an MA in Maritime Archaeology and History from East Carolina University and is a NOAA science diver. Since 2002, she has worked with a number of national marine sanctuaries. Deborah has extensive knowledge on preparing National Register of Historic Places nominations and has co-authored over a dozen shipwreck nominations, including three multiple property submissions and one historic and archaeological district. Welcome. Well, as Val mentioned this morning, we're, we're ecstatic in Maryland that, um, that our nomination has, uh, that NOAA has issued its notice of intent to go forward with the public process on Mallows Bay as um, a national marine sanctuary. Um, as you all know, the new process involves a very community-driven um, uh, method, and we have probably over 60 people sending in submissions or letters of support. Um, we have a very active group on this, and um, I'll come to that in a moment, but I'm just to get us started. Uh, um, <clears throat> so Mallows Bay is, is mostly known for and is quite outstanding for this collection of vessels, and there are nearly 100, 300 foot vessels stuffed into a mi half mile wide embayment. So at low tide, you can almost walk across on them. And this certainly is what, what comes to the fore. Um, I don't, most people overuse, overuse or misuse the word unique, but it certainly is one of the very rare collections of ships of this nature. And perhaps it is the only one, the only ship's graveyard, where they are all from, largely from one era, which is the World War I era. So we're, we're very excited about all of this. Uh, but there's a lot more, there are many more stories to tell with this. And um, we'll come to that in a moment. There are a lot of cultural elements um, in the landscape beyond these vessels. But you can see many of them throughout the, the photos as we go along. These are absolutely enormous ships, and it, it's a very impressive uh, st set of structures. Now, as I said, there are other elements, and these you know, are part of the stories we have yet to tell and that also make up the, um, you know, the, the landscape and history of the bay because they've all left their imprimatur on the, um, the land around the bay and in the bay itself. Um, there are, you know, not the native peoples who have occupied the area and their traditional uses, and we have had Piscataway representatives on our uh, steering committee from the very beginning, and they've been extremely helpful in putting this, um, our proposals together, and we're working with several educational institutions like the St. Mary's College or the Mer College of Southern um, uh, Maryland to consider, um, you know, archaeology in the future and, and further studies of these uses. We have at least one, we believe, Revolutionary War vessel in the era, um, the, a longship from the Protector. So it's not all World War I. Um, you can see that we had two intervals of fishing, um, the 1820s, 1860s. There's no commercial fishery in the area now, a great deal of recreational fishing, but certainly um, at the time there was a very active sturgeon fishery and canning, a caviar cannery. So these are all other stories that interrelate with the landscape, and there are still structures from all of these. Um, the Civil War, uh, the park, the land base is actually on the site of Camp McGaw, and there were, um, the, the road system was developed it with um, crossing the Potomac, both prior to the Civil War, but largely developed during the Civil War. We're not too far across the river from Quantico, so they, um, they're, they're very happy to, to have their view shed protected with this lovely historic site. And, um, of course, the main focus, as I mentioned, when you first look at it, this eye-popping number of vessels there from the um, civilian, the U, uh, U.S. Emergency Shipping Board uh, fleet that were w largely wooden steamships. They were built in a number of shipyards around the country, and um, you know, all of them were sold off for, for the cost of one. 
uh, vessel at the end of the day and they were out in the river for a long time but they kept breaking loose and causing hazards to navigation and catching fire and finally the Marines spoke to the civilian shipping board and said you have to get these out of the river and that's why they ended up there. There are still some in the river and there are some that went to other places. There are some in James River, there are some up in Baltimore. So there are more of these vessels around. Um, during the Depression, it became a, a mom and pop well, sort of wildcat salvage area because the companies themselves had gone under. And at one point, it was providing 15% of the per capita income for the county uh, during the Depression. And of course, uh, also related to this, these shipbreaking periods, we find other signs of, um, well, when you're out in the middle of nowhere, you need something. We have stills up on the land. We found some floating. We don't know if we have floating brothels. We know they were in the area. There may be um, some wine, women, and song on the, on the Potomac. Um, and during the Second World War, Bethlehem Steel built a burning basin in the back, so there's another addition to this. Um, ultimately, of course, determined that it wasn't worth the, the effort of, of trying to, do the, to break them all down. Um, between 46 and modern times, there were other efforts. We can talk about them over, over cocktails, but um, largely, of course, the ship slumbered on. Um, and there were, there were other concerns about dragging them out. So they end up staying there, thank goodness. And now largely we're, uh, the focus is recreation and heritage tourism. And um, kayaking is amazing, so do bring your kayaks down. So you can see the uh, evidence of the ship breaking here. Um, there are still about 80 vessels in the bay, another 10 around. So there's a lot of them. There's also the litter mentality. If somebody else dumps their stuff, it's a fine place to dump yours. So there are other vessels that were left there. The most recent addition, 1973, was a, a steel-hulled Hog Island ferry. So there are other, other um, vessels in the area as well um, that are part of the landscape. And we have, um, the area's been surveyed. We had it uh, surveyed by um, well, a number of people, but Donald Chomet, the maritime author, actually uh, wrote up the area. He's writing some more revised books now, but he helped document all of these, played a key role in this. And over the past, next 20 years, we've done assessments of the environment. The, um, the lower uh, left photo uh, is the Institute for Maritime History, helping document some of the vessels at Widewater off Virginia. And um, there's the burning basin, of course, as I mentioned, and all, there are shipways from um, barges from other shipbreaking periods. So there's all these contributing elements to these vessels that you can see um, on the right-hand side. And wonderful teaching opportunities, um, studying the taphonomy of the vessels, ship architecture. We have student groups interested in using them. We're also um, documenting and interested in documenting the, um, the flora and fauna. These vessels um, themselves are providing really a platform for going forward with a lot of um, not just the cultural studies but natural studies. They're a nursery for the very popular bass fishery. Um, it's a living laboratory. We're not going to haul the vessels out. We're not doing any mechanical preservation. So they are going to continue to rejoin nature. But in the interim, um, I looked up the rare, threatened, and endangered species of the county, thinking there'd be half a dozen, three pages of them, most of which reside in this bay. Uh, so we have you know, this, this very um, you know, significant preservation aspect, but there's also the invasive species, hydrilla, nutria. There's a study there that can be done as well. Sorry, my own timer is trying to tell me things. Um, so I'll, just, I'll, I'll pass it off to Didi here, but I'll just say that you know, we're looking very much at integrating the flora, the fauna, um, cultural studies, natural studies, and looking very much, as I said, at this as a living laboratory with a lot of stories to tell as we go forward in a very holistic way, not just any one aspect. They all contribute to the greater good. You, you get two of us for the price of one, so this is great. Uh, so thank you. So what do we do with these amazing resources and this incredible history? Well, of course, we nominate it to the National Register. So earlier this year, uh, NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries undertook nominating Mallows Bay to the National Register to give the area recognition that was also done in partnership with the state, of course, as well as other partners. So in April 2015, it was listed as a historic and archaeological district. Woohoo! It uh, qualified mainly due to its association with the World War I shipbreaking activities, even though, as uh, was mentioned earlier, there are a number of other sites not associated with those shipbreaking pursuits. So a little bit about the district, just to give you some perspective if, uh, as a comparison if you're thinking about doing a district or you've done one of your own. 
The district is 11,000 acres or 17 square miles within Maryland state waters only. This includes 124 vessels. 101 of them are World War I era steamships with varying de degrees of structural integrity. I would highly suggest that you Google Mallows Bay. There's some amazing aerial photography as well as uh, all the kayakers take great pictures. So it, it's, a, it's a really neat, uh, I don't say ship graveyard, but uh, it's worth taking a look. There's also 23 other sites that are not related to the shipbreaking activities that were also part of this district. And I think that's what makes a district really important is that you can have contributing resources that are part of this unique environment but not necessarily uh, relevant to uh, some of the topics. We also have eight debris piles of uh, vessels that have not been identified. Those are including the possible Revolutionary War vessel, lots of small craft, uh, schooners, and uh, several barges. So it seemed once people saw, hey, there's, uh, there's all this you know, great territory here, we're just going to abandon our vessel and uh, don't have to worry about it. So it definitely did become a, a, a depositing uh, area. So there's also interesting six non-vessel sites. These include wharfs, pilings, and uh, the physical alteration of the landscape that went along with the shipbreaking operation. So that's where I think that we can adapt the maritime cultural landscape approach more than we have done in the past. So why is it significant? Well, it fits uh, three of the criteria. The first one, criteria A. It's association with World War I U.S. Shipping Board Emergency Fleet Shipbreaking Operations. To give you a little background, they basically didn't know what to do with these vessels, so uh, a company bought them up, brought them up to Mallows Bay, uh, burned them, brought them to shore, and scrapped them. So if you can imagine all of these vessels tied up together and some of the pictures on fire, and then the poor guys that had to go in and uh, get all of the materials out. Uh, not a good thing to do, I imagine. Uh, interestingly, this was a test bed where they developed shipbreaking techniques for later on use. So I think that's one of the aspects that we can elaborate on more. We think it's the largest assemblage of steamships in the world and a substantial component of the entire U.S. merchant marine fleet that was built between 1970, 1917 and 1922. Their ships represented from shipyards all around the country and they're also wooden and composite, which is a really interesting juxtaposition and various designs. There were several, several design types of these emergency fleet steamships and all of those types are represented in the district. Uh, for criteria B or D, excuse me, the archaeological sites provide information on vessel design, use and adaptation along with shipbreaking and salvage operations as well as site formation process and the landscape alteration which I talked about. So this is really a good example of the interaction between man and the landscape. They brought these ships there, they built wharfs, they built coffer dams, they really, really changed the environment in order to suit the needs. So I think that's where, the, again, the maritime cultural landscape is a, is a good way to approach this. So I think as a matter of thought, uh, looking back at writing the district nomination and uh, now thinking about the maritime cultural landscape approach, there's some uh, different ways that we could have approached it that we were lacking in by using the maritime cultural landscape lens. Uh, the main focus of the nomination was the World War I era shipbreaking, but uh, there's a lot more history as a, you know, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War that could be elaborated on, but since you can't write everything about everything, you kind of have to limit uh, what your rationale is by doing these landscapes. Um, the sites are only in Maryland state waters in the district, even though there are sites on the Virginia side. Uh, things play into it and it just was easier for the process to limit ourselves to, uh, to those in Maryland. But uh, it should be recognized that there are other sites over on the other side. Um, we also have strong ties to other associated historical and archaeological sites. There's 20 unfinished hulls that were abandoned in Texas that I think are worth noting. And also uh, in Curtis Bay, Maryland, there's a bunch of abandoned steamships, as well as uh, the James River, where they staged these vessels before bringing them up to Mallows. So I think the cultural landscape approach can widen this and be able to recognize these other places. We also need some more context for the non-World War I shipbreaking archaeological sites. We've got to go out and confirm, is this actually a Revolutionary War era vessel? I think that would add a lot to the region. And also include more connections to the land, the Native American peoples, the traditional uses, as well as the nature and the biological aspect. So what does this all mean now? So as you heard, uh, Mallows Bay is on tap to potentially be a National Marine Sanctuary. So again, this is a community-driven process. They came to NOAA, prepared the nomination, and submitted it back in 2014. 
and it was accepted in 15 and the Federal Register notice just went out uh, about a week ago that the uh, scoping and draft EIS management plan are going to be prepared. So I think this is a great news and uh, it is looking to not only include the historical resources but also the natural resources because of the, uh, the, the kayaking and the endangered species and just I think it's a good fit. So if anybody is interested, I do have some more information about the process if you're looking to nominate a, a site in your community. And I think uh, the four criteria for the nominations is something that we should all think about if you're looking for other sites for potential sanctuaries. The nominations need to address the area's natural resources and ecological qualities and that they are special significance. On our neck of the woods, the area contains submerged maritime heritage resources of special historical, cultural, or archaeological significance. And in fact, the nomination must address how they fit the National Register criteria. So I think that's a really important gauge to use. It also talks about the present and potential economic uses of the site related to tourism, fishing. I don't think we're doing much diving, but that could be included. And how the conservation and management of those resources can aid with the heritage tourism. And there must be a publicly derived benefit of the area depending on the conservation and management of this area. So I think uh, if you're interested in submitting comments on this, we welcome them. And if, again, if you're in a community that you want a, a National Marine Sanctuary, turn in those nominations. We want some more. And uh, we want some more shipwreck ones. Uh, Wisconsin and Mallows isn't enough. We want some more. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll take questions.